button. And so let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internet before we go ahead and get started. Because we got some business to attend to today. It's an amazing Wednesday. I hope your week is unfolding very nicely. You're accomplishing everything you set your mind to. Are the tubes connected? They are. That's tremendous. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney. And today, we're talking about Jack Smith, and he's getting a little bit irritable with Judge Cannon. He is telling her, listen, Judge, if you don't rule on these jury instructions and tell us what you're going to be doing in the classified documents case, well, guess what, Cannon? We're just going to go ahead and appeal you up to the 11th Circuit, and we'll see what they have to say about it. So we'll call Jack Smith and his little motion a threat. He's saying, you better find in our favor or else, and we'll read through the filing. Okay, a lot of people on the left are very excited about this, saying, okay, Jack Smith's not playing around anymore. He's pulling out the big guns now. He's not mean vision, right? Whatever, you know, nonsense. So we'll read through it. We'll hit some of the highlights. We'll see what Judge Cannon does with it. And maybe he will appeal her. Hopefully he does. We have this one from Tristan, who is a, a person who looks like a Tristan. We'll see what he said about this on MSNBC. And then the TDS Spice Girls were all around again. Yes, that's right. Alyssa Farah, clavicle girl, and the other one who's just kind of tagging along like a groupie. So we'll see what they're all up to and what's happening there in Florida. Then we're turning our attention over to New York. We had a couple of filings drop today. First of all, yesterday on the show, we talked about Alvin Bragg and his prosecution against Trump. Of course, he requested a gag order saying that Donald Trump should not be allowed to speak because when Trump speaks, it wrecks their case, especially when Trump talks about the judge's daughter and the fact that she's raised almost $100 million for Democrats working for a Democratic extension called Authentic Campaigns that's worked for Kamala Harris, for example. So Bragg wants Trump silenced. Trump responded, of course, we read through this on yesterday's show, saying that Judge Juan Mercan needs to be recused and thrown on out of there. Bragg is responding to this saying, this judge is incredible. He's the most brilliant person we've ever known or met in New York. And so how dare you ask that he be recused? Now then, simultaneously today, okay, there are a lot of stuff coming out against Trump. Judge Mercon, this was not a surprise, we knew this was coming, denies Trump's presidential immunity, calls it untimely, says, no, nope, you don't have any immunity, I don't care if the Supreme Court's ruling on whatever, you're done. Because this judge is doing everything that they can to get this case on track for trial. Michael Avenatti, remember him? He's in prison. Even Michael Avenatti is out here saying this gag order from Juan Mercan is completely ridiculous. So we'll see what he says about it. And MSE, M MSNBC had more reaction from this guy. Hillary Clinton was out there calling Trump an existential threat. Stephen Smith said, this is a big mistake, Hillary. And Trump had some reaction saying, sorry, Hillary, you're the threat, not me, sister. So we also have a final segment today which is gonna be talking about our friends from Nebraska. So if you are from Nebraska, or if you know anybody from Nebraska, or if you think about Nebraska or driving through Nebraska or anything Nebraska related, all right, they need to pass this bill, all right? LB 764, shout out to Charlie Kirk who has really launched this thing into the stratosphere, amazing work. We see here Charlie posted a couple things about LB 764, which would make Nebraska a winner take all state and if that happens, that is going to preclude the Democrats from getting one very critical electoral vote that they want very badly because they need this to win. Trump also supported Charlie Kirk. Jim Pillen, the governor of Nebraska, supported Charlie Kirk. And then the senator switched there in Nebraska, and they're freaked out about this. All right, they're hitting a red alert button. We're going to read a couple articles about it. And then we'll listen to this guy who was a former Obama guy says, I can't believe they're changing the rules in the middle of the election. Give me a break. Okay. That's exactly what they did in 2020. All of the rules got changed because of my COVID. So as you can see, my friends, 
We got three good segments today. We'll hit the highlights on some of the filings and then see what you have to say about all of this. We also had a great members only stream this morning where we spent some time talking about the 2024 election. We talk about other stuff that we can't get to here with our members on the morning and in during our after parties and on our Saturday streams. And today we spent some time talking about Dr. Jill. She was very uh, irritated when they said that Joe Biden was losing six out of the seven swing states that he needs to win, you know. So we went through a lot of that, talking about some Middle East stuff, talking about a lot of the things that we just can't squeeze in here. So we'd love it if you came and joined us. We are supported by you, our viewers and our members, and we're grateful for your support. One way you can do that, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Links down in the description below. Also, robertgovea.com. If you want to catch any PDFs, if you want to read the reports on the segments, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, if you want to check out the calendar of the show of upcoming proceedings and so on, all there, robertgovea.com, linked down below. And also, watcherlodge.com. We are now launching our Sovereignty Saturdays, my friend. And so, my friends, so quarter two, we're going to start increasing the pace of what's happening over there at the lodge. We are in quarter two now, so it's time to go. And so every Saturday, we're going to be getting together talking about sovereignty and self-development at watcherlodge.com. All free. Come and join us. Just go over there, register, and uh, sign up. Add it to your calendar every single Saturday, baby. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. We also have our shopping tab enabled on the YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube and you want to get some fresh new clothes, which, you know, we all do. You know, if you're like me, I do that like once every you know, decade or so. So we got some new new clothes. These are Travis Matthew polos. Big fan of them. You can get them on Nordstrom's. Click our shopping tab and you'll see some of the ones that I have actually, uh, that I've actually purchased. So you can shop through there. Click our link. And it's not just for the dudes out there. Ladies, follow those links. Load your carts up with all sorts of good stuff. You deserve it. You work hard and you can support the channel by shopping. How incredible is that? So we've got that as well. And thanks for supporting us. However you choose to support us, we're grateful for it. All right. Now, without any further ado, it is time. Jack Smith threatens Judge Cannon, very unhappy with her because she's not issuing a ruling that he wants. He wants Trump to be, I guess, executed immediately, but that's not going to happen. So the next best thing is he wants the jury instructions to be rigged in his favor. And of course, Trump's team has said, no, we don't want that to happen. And Judge Cannon has released some jury instructions that Jack Smith is very upset about. And so he filed this motion raging at her saying, if you don't find in our favor, guess what, Judge? We're appealing this, and we're going to appeal it very hard, and you're going to feel very bad about it when we do. So we're going to read through some of the highlights from Jack's raging motion and see what the left is so excited about. They're doing cartwheels over this motion. Finally, Jack Smith is coming to play. He's showing up now. Judge Cannon's on her heels and all the things you hear from Brzezinski and so on. You're going to hear it from Tristan, who we're going to hear from in a little bit, and from the Spice Girls, from the TDS Spice Girls. So we'll hear from them, but let's see what Jack Smith is so hot and bothered over. Here is what the filing says. It's from Jack. It is West Palm Beach Division, Southern District of Florida. Courtroom is Judge Cannon presiding. This is deranged thug Jack Smith's response to the instructions, the jury instructions, and the verdict forms on these counts. And we've already read through Judge Cannon's interpretation of the law and is basically saying, as we remember here, because we've read through the opinion from Amy Jackson, I believe her name is, in Amy Berman Jackson in the DC circuit and the Clinton sock drawer case with his literal recordings. Okay, Bill Clinton, as a recap on that case, Bill Clinton had some historian, you know, archivist, writing, you know, author person come sit in with him and audio record a bunch of files for the for a book he was writing. Well, problem is some of those audio recordings captured the president doing the presidential duties, okay, actually doing the job of the presidency. So it wasn't like Clinton was just like meandering, you know, here, here's what I, what I kind of remember. The audio captured the president in action, literally. So, of course, Judicial Watch sued, said, oh, that's curious. That is a presidential record under the Presidential Records Act. Sued to get their access on that and their hands on it. And the D.C. Circuit came back out and said, what are you, nuts? You want us to go and tell a president what is presidential records or what is personal? You think that we have the authority to do that? We don't. We're a court. And the Presidential Records Act by Congress doesn't give us any judicial review over the matter. And if we did, 
what is the standard that would apply, right? It's not in the law that says that we can do this. So why do you think that we can? And how can we decide that, right? What is the standard of review to, to measure a president's decision against? How much deference should we give the president when they decide whether it's personal or not? What should we do when they don't comply, right? All of these questions that are clearly ambiguous. And so she said, this is nuts, right? I, I can't tell you the court can't override the president because they're his records. And that was the decision from her. So now Jack Smith comes back out and says, that's all you know, ridiculous. Says this court, and, and, and on that basis, okay, on the basis of that sock drawer case, the, the instructions were that you can't essentially challenge a president's discretion when they decide whether something is presidential or not. And Bill Clinton didn't go through some formal process and, and declare those his personal records. He just didn't turn those back in. He just left the White House, didn't give them as a presidential record, right? He didn't turn them over. And so the argument was that the archivist from NARA had no authority to go cobble those back. All that changed, of course, when it comes to Trump. But the precedent was set with Clinton. So the instructions were based on that precedent saying, well, we've already done this before. If we can't challenge a presidential decision on how to classify those records, that's the end of the story. So Jack's freaking out about that. He says, this court issued an order directing the parties to file proposed jury instructions. And you had in here, the judge wrote, engage two competing scenarios and give me your thoughts on it. So Jack is saying, all right, I reviewed both of your scenarios, Judge Cannon, which we read through here full previously in a prior video. And both scenarios rest on a flawed legal premise, namely that the Presidential Records Act, and in particular, the distinction between personal and presidential records, determines whether a former president, Trump, is entitled or authorized under the Espionage Act, which again, this is an act of Congress, okay? So I always make this point that this is an Espionage Act, which is Congress trying to override the presidential authority to have his own documents, which is granted to him under Article Two of the Constitution. So unless 18 U.S. Code 793 is a constitutional amendment, it is subordinate to the president's Article Two powers. Sorry, Congress. And honestly, I mean, there could be an argument that the whole, the whole stinking act is, is invalid as applied to the president, right? Unconstitutional. It might be apply, it might be constitutional to everyone else, but they're not the president. They don't have Article Two powers, all right? That's, and this statute was applied to everybody, not the president. So if it's applied to the president and it tries to override him, unconstitutional. So Jack Smith is, because of, of course, right? It's a statute. It's not passed by co constitutional amendment. So Jack is gonna continue to rely on this. He says, and there are other contrary rules from other executive orders. And so the legal premise is wrong. And a jury instruction from you, Cannon, would distort this trial. The PRA's distinction between personal and presidential has no bearing on whether a former president possession of documents that contains national defense information is authorized under the Espionage Act. And Jack says the PRA should play no role in the jury instructions. I don't think so. Sorry, Jack. No, indeed, based on the current record, the PRA should not play any role at trial at all because the PRA is devastating to their case because Bill Clinton used it to keep his records and Trump could easily rely on that as precedent and say no one was prosecuted before because guess what? No one was. And no one has been, right? Joe Biden had classified documents, no big deal. Now, moreover, it is vitally important that the court promptly decide, okay, here comes Jack Smith's threat, whether the unstated legal premise underlying the recent order does in the court's view, whether you believe it is a correct formulation of the law, right? This is Jack saying, you better decide this real fast or else. If the court wrongfully concludes that it does and that it intends to include the Presidential Records Act in the jury instructions regarding what is authorized, it must inform the parties of that decision well in advance of trial. Why? Because Jack Smith wants to go and appeal this thing. We must be able to consider the appellate review. We're going to take this up to the circuit court. If this court, says Jack, concludes, as you posited in your order, if you say, and watch what Jack does here, if you say that under the Espionage Act that a former president is authorized to possess any document that the jury determines qualifies as a presidential record, or personal record rather, under the PRA, 
that would wrongly present the jury a factual determination that, that should have no legal consequence under the elements of 793, right? So Jack is trying to charge him like he's a regular civilian citizen defendant. He's not, he's the president. So he gets the Presidential Records Act. And Jack is saying, well, that can't conflict with the Espionage Act. Yes, it can. And also Article Two powers, which the PRA is basically building on. Now, likewise, if the court concludes as posited in scenario B, and, and watch what Jack does here. It's so ridiculous. Like Judge Cannon never said any of what Jack Smith is going to say. This was not in her order that we read. But he says, if this court concludes like you did, Cannon, that Donald Trump has carte blanche to remove any document from the White House at the end of his presidency, that any document so removed must be treated as a personal record under the PRA as an unreviewable matter of law, and that also as a matter of law, that a former president is forever authorized to possess such a document, regardless of how highly classified it may be and how it may be stored, that would constitute a clearly erroneous jury instruction that would, 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 would entail a high probability of failure. Right now, this is not how Cannon phrased it, right? This is snark. You may not be able to sense it, but he's being snarky here. Okay, Ken, if you can say Trump can do whatever he wants all the time with the documents all the time, no matter what, and act like Big Fanny with no consequences, doing whatever he wants all the time, well, then you're going to be clearly erroneous. And, and to be honest with you, I think that he's clearly erroneous on this. Yeah, because what, what is, what's the opposite proposition here? So what are you saying? A document... He's author. So, so who, who is authorized then? Who is more authorized to tell the president? No, Jack, who is that? You Con some prosecutor somewhere who gets to override the, the, the chief executive of the whole country. Huh? That's strange. I, I don't, I don't think that's in the constitution anywhere. So if someone is, uh, is above the president, like for example, if Trump has to get permission from someone to say, oh, this is highly classified. It's the utmost classified. Um, who does Trump have to talk to to get permission to get that document back? Who is that? Mark Milley? Does he have to call Nancy Pelosi? Who is that? Does he have to go through the DOD, NARA, Deborah Steidel wall? No. It's the president, right? And you know, I don't think that they were thinking about that when they wrote the Espionage Act, how it applies to the presidency. But if Jack wants a test in here, what's the test, Jack? You, you get the authority. You're not even legally appointed there, bro. You are not appointed by the president or confirmed by the Senate. So you get to be the judge. We get your discretion on how this applies. No. Constitution dictates that the president, it's article two, section two, clause one. The president has the right to his, the opinion of his executives in writing, okay? That's that's document power. They're his. If he has to get permission from someone else, they're the president. So I'd like to know what Jack's, what Jack's you know, alternative here is. I guess Deborah Steidel Wall is, and what's the authority for that? Now, as in any case, Jack continues, the court may defer ruling on certain aspects of jury instructions when the jury instructions might turn on evidence that's presented at trial, you know, for example, whether the jury should be instructed on all these things. But the question of whether the PRA has an impact on the element of unauthorized possession under Section 93A, right? So the law has different rules. Someone has to be have, have unauthorized possession. Trump is saying, I was, it wasn't unauthorized at all. It was perfectly authorized as a personal record following the Bill Clinton precedent. Does not turn on any evidentiary issue and it cannot be deferred. It is purely a question of law that must be decided promptly. If the court were to, defer, were to defer a decision on that fundamental legal question, it would inject substantial delay into this trial. It would prevent the government from seeking review before jeopardy attaches. And we need to know. So as instructed by the court, the government provides a clear and well-supported jury instruction for these elements. The proposed instruction correctly instructs the jury that the element of unauthorized possession just depends on the statute. That's it. On executive orders here, 
and on executive orders implementing regulation, and it makes no mention of any designations under the PRA. Okay, so again, they're trying to cordon Trump off. They're just trying to charge him like he's a regular citizen. Says, oh, we've already got a bunch of rules on this, and the Presidential Records Act doesn't apply. You can't use that as, a, as a, an escape valve. Now, as required by the court's order, the government also provides jury instructions that incorporate the inaccurate legal premises that are reflected in the other scenarios. And furthermore, even though resolution of the threshold legal issue is purely a matter of law, so you should decide that now, right? It doesn't go to the jury. The court should be aware at the outset that Trump's entire effort to rely on the Presidential Records Act is not based on any facts, which is weird because Jack Smith said that the decision to move the boxes was done on January 20th at the tail end of the Trump presidency, which means those were presidential acts. He, he's not alleging that he stole those boxes. He was like, like, in other words, like Trump's presidency had ended and then he ran in and took the boxes and then left. Like, that's not what happened. He was in possession of them. He just said they should have been turned back over to the government. Trump said, no, they're not yours. So Jack in his indictment, right, even admits that these were done during, the, the boxes were taken during the presidency. Jack says, it is a post hoc justification and after the fact justification that was concocted more than a year after he left the White House. And his invocation in this court of the PRA is not grounded in any decision that he actually made during his presidency to designate as personal any of the records charged in the indictment. So Jack, again, is missing the whole point. The Clinton precedent says, who, who does he need to designate it to? He needs to fill out a form? And what happens if he doesn't fill out the form? Are you nuts? So he didn't, he, you know, the fact that he lit, like literally took the documents, this is in Amy Berman Jackson's opinion. The fact that Bill Clinton didn't turn in the presidential records, okay? Just like turning in your homework. Here, these are, these are my records. Archive these, archivist. The fact that Clinton didn't do that, guess what? That means they're not presidential records. And the archivist, according to Berman Jackson, doesn't have the authority to challenge the presidential discretion. So, and, and Bill Clinton didn't formally declare any of that anything. He just took it and didn't turn it in. That's all you need to do. So, and first of all, Jack Smith doesn't know this either. Okay, Jack Smith doesn't know every single decision that Trump made. He wasn't there. He's not Donald Trump. He can't read his mind. So, so maybe Trump did rely on this, right? Maybe his legal counsel did say, and he was meeting with Tom Fitton from Judicial Watch, shout out to them, who brought out the original underlying challenge against Clinton. They were all in the same circle, okay? Trump was getting the ear of those people. So accordingly, they say, before turning to the jury instructions, we are providing factual context about Trump and how he's trying to inject the Presidential Records Act into these proceedings. Now, importantly, Trump has never represented to this court that he, in fact, designated the documents as personal. Again, th that is not his requirement to do that. Clinton just took them. He doesn't have to fill out a form. If he did, then the person who was in charge of the form is the person who has the authority. Just to be crystal clear about that. If Trump fills out a form, I'm making this declared and somebody, oh, sorry, that's too classified. You can't have that. That person has the power, not Trump. And that's not how it works. He made no such claim in his motion to dismiss, nor was he required to. He doesn't have to tell you what he's doing. In his reply or at the hearing, despite every opportunity and every incentive to do so. No, but he brought it up now. Now, as discussed below, the reason is simple. He never did so. And again, he's not required to do like, Jack Smith wants you to like stamp it and, you know, have two people turn the key. Doesn't have to do that. He's the president. Instead, he has attempted to fashion out of whole cloth a legal presumption that would operate untethered to any facts. Again, that's up for the jury to decide there, Jack. So you're asking, this is so bad. They're asking, I can't even believe it. Like this is a special counsel. They're, they're just, they're ask, they're telling Judge Cannon that it's a, it's a purely legal question, okay, whether Trump can rely on the Presidential Records Act, but then they jump into facts, right? There's a difference between a factual question, which is something we leave up to the jurors, and a legal question, which is something we leave up to the judge, right? The, the jurors don't know the law. So the judge decides the law, the jurors decide the facts. So Jack Smith, in his idiocy, and his dumb prosecution team down there, 
in this literally in the same paragraph, okay, they say it's purely a matter of law, but you, your honor, should rely on the facts in order to justify your legal decision, right? All of this is a factual dispute that is up for the jury to decide. Now he acknowledges, right? Okay, well, it is a purely legal matter and so you can decide this on your own. But anyways, Trump didn't rely on it at all. And by, by going into this, right, he's basically admitting this op opens up an opportunity for Trump to rebut all of this, right? Trump has his story. Maybe he did. Maybe he met with Tom Fitton multiple times. And Tom Fitton said, PRA, Bill Clinton, sock drawer case. And Trump used that, right? So all of this is now subject to factual dispute. And Jack is just, you know, the, the same dumb lawyers who say that the Colorado ballot removal decision was incredible or doing backflips over this one. So just take that for what it is. So without regard to his actual decision or his actual intent, the unambiguous definition of what constitutes personal records or the plainly non-personal content of the documents, there is no basis in law or fact for that legal presumption. And therefore the court should reject Trump's effort to invent one to bring and inject the PRA into this case says there is no colorable argument that anything is a personal record to the contrary they're classified making them presidential records it's, it's not straightforward okay because judge berman jackson said that bill clinton was the sole person who got to decide whether they're presidential or not you don't get to challenge that because you're not the president so jack's trying to go into all this indicia to sort of make his claim and then they're saying Trump has not argued otherwise. Indeed, it would be pure fiction to suggest that highly classified documents created by the so-called intelligence community were purely private and that they do not relate or have an effect upon carrying out. It's the same thing. It's this, literally the same thing as Clinton. So they'll rely on that. But Trump has sought to inject the PRA and saying that he, is, he would be impervious to, to, to judicial review which is exactly what they talk about in Judicial Watch. Now, the argument that they'll make against Judicial Watch is that they're a third party entity, right? And that this was NARA. But if you read the decision, and I reviewed it again today before the show, you see some very, very serious doubts there from Berman Jackson, the judge, about whether NARA has the authority to even go after and challenge anything that the president has already decided is not presidential. So during its exhaustive investigation, says Jack, the government interviewed Trump's own PRA representatives and other numerous high rank ranking officials from the White House. Not a single one had heard Trump say that he was designating records as personal. And he doesn't need to. He doesn't have to give an order, right? He's the president. He just does it. At the time, he caused the transfer of the boxes. He believed that he didn't tell them that he believed the removal of the records to be designated as personal. To the contrary, every witness who was asked this question had never heard such a thing. This is bizarre. So Jack, it sounds like this is a factual issue that should be decided at trial, isn't it? You can present your evidence and Trump can present his. So why are you trying to foreclose on this possibility? They say some, this is all fact stuff, okay? Some of the clearest evidence that Trump did not designate the documents come from his own statements. For example, during a year of correspondence, they didn't bring it up. They, they didn't even mention it all the correspondence back and forth and his off the record interview with writers trump never suggested that they were personal records or anything and later after trump gave some boxes back he says you know what these are presidential records you can have these back trump released a public statement in response saying they didn't find anything and so there again this is this is a kind of we're, we're going to fast forward through a lot of this because it, it's all fact right Jack Smith just got done lecturing us about how this is a purely legal issue and Judge Cannon better rule on it right now and then goes through all these facts. Like, okay, Jack, if you think that the Presidential Records Act is not a part of this, well, then make your case. But it sounds like the Presidential Records Act is actually dispositive. Like, it's a big deal. That's why you were asking everybody about it, isn't it? Why are you asking everybody about Presidential Records Act, personal records? Because you know it's a big deal. And here are some statements from Judicial Watch. Apparently, that Trump here on February, the Washington Post article, the president of Judicial Watch, right here, 
posted the following two statements on X. Says the left-wing media is being dishonest about the Trump records issue. A president has discretion on what docs to retain as presidential records while in office. So the law allows Trump to tear up documents, shred them, take documents when he left the White House, do whatever he wants. Yeah, he's right. Fun story. Judicial Watch sued over Bill Clinton, hiding the records in his sock drawer. Colt courts told us to pound sand. He's right. I read the opinion. It's Judicial Watch versus NARA, Amy Berman Jackson, D.C. Circuit Court. Because presidents essentially can do whatever they want with their records. They're theirs. How dare we tell a president who got elected by the American people that, sorry, Deborah is in charge of their, their records. Remember this when you hear anti-Trump media caterwauling about him tearing up documents. Yeah, so uh, Jack Smith is going to go through the rest of this. If you want to read the full thing, we'll put the PDF up on our uh, website, robertgovea.com. But Jay Bratt wrote this. It is just a stupid uh, opinion. He says... For the reasons here, the court should reject the legal premise that the PRA has any part of this. As such, it should deny Trump's motion and adopt our jury instructions. If you don't, let us know right now, says Jay Bratt, long before a jeopardy attaches because we are about to seek appellate review. Signed by Jay Bratt, David Harbach, out of Florida. So they want... You know, they want to isolate Trump from the other protections of the law. They admit that the Presidential Records Act is pretty important and it does exonerate him. You know why? Because they asked everybody about it. Now, the fact that everybody about it didn't know anything about it doesn't it doesn't mean that Trump wasn't using that power as we saw. Right. Tom Fitton and others have set the precedent by suing Bill Clinton and the judge established then that no one can challenge the presidential authority? If so, how do you do it? What are the limits on that? What's the standard of review? What's the statute of limitations? How much discretion do you afford the, the president? What's the balancing test? You know, is it ultra top secret or only super tox? You know, what's the standard? No guidance to that at all because it's the president's record. And the standard is obvious when it's Bill Clinton, but not obvious when it's Trump, apparently. So let's see what some people are saying about these Trump prosecutions. This guy's called Tristan. He looks like a Tristan, sounds like a Tristan. And he is, of course, on MSNBC. And we're not inside Jen Psaki today. We're inside Michael Steele. Ah, he's filling in. This is going to take. Um, is, is there something that, you know, we should be looking at being dragged out? Or is this something that could get turned around pretty quickly? Yeah. Donald Trump's biggest weapon when he's trying to evade justice, and I talk about this a ton in my book, is delay. Ultimately, a lot of the things that he does, what are all these distractions, the clown car full of lawyers? What, what is he trying to do here? He's just trying to throw sand right. into the gears of justice, try to actually stop it from happening. It's called due process of law, Tristan. Trump has a right to, you know, review evidence, to have evidentiary hearings, to file motions to, to dismiss, to take things up to the Court of Appeals. He's not delaying anything. Their side delayed all four of these by waiting until 2023 to drop all the charges simultaneously, right? Trump asking for slight delays. These cases shouldn't go for years, right? This is a 2016 case, by the way, the New York case is, is 2016 is when it all originally started. And the Florida classified documents case that apparently the crime started on January 20th, 2021. So why did they wait until August of all of these, you know, of 2023, essentially to start dropping charges because they are using it as election interference, Tristan, you know that. And then he hopes that this is going to cause other things to break his way. And in the context of the election, he's hoping that it's going to allow him somehow to win and then be able to wave some sort of magic kingly wand and, you know, monarch or dictator his way out of all of this. It's not actually a monarchy or a dictatorship, okay? That's called the power of the presidency. And if the people elect Donald Trump, you know what that is? It's the people's veto of the prosecution. They just say, yeah, this is not, obviously he's not an insurrectionist terrorist, whatever you guys psychos say on MSNBC. But what happens is Trump goes in, he takes the executive office again, and now he's in charge of the DOJ and he should, with a stroke of a pen, just get rid of it all and reopen investigations into them. 
How about that, right? If you're going to use power as a cudgel against your political enemies, well, then we'll do it too. And this is due process. It is not delay, delay, delay. And Trump would exercise the power of the presidency to reverse this. And I'm very, very pleased with myself on this pause and how long it's been on here on this frame. So we'll just let it sit there another second. Okay, so that is Tristan. And I told you, looks and sounds like a Tristan. But we also have out there TDS Spice Girls. Now, we're very familiar with them. We know Clavicle Girl and Alyssa Farah. I think she's on The View still. They make up two of the three. I can never remember the other woman's uh, name, you know, this blonde here, because she's just not as important or even as well-known as the rest of them. But they're out there, okay, sitting in front of this principles first, principles first, okay? Clavicle Girl, in my opinion, is a bona fide liar. She met with Liz Cheney four times, and then on the fourth time came up with the clavicle story that apparently she made up out of thin air. No one ever told her about it, according to the people who she said told her about it. They said, what? Clavicle? What the hell is she talking about? So here are the TDS Spice Girls. They're making their tour around talking to brain dead Democrats. What I want to tell you as somebody who knew him very well and spent a lot of time with him is the worst things you have heard are only scratching the surface. No, oh, no. This is an unprecedented moment that we are in. That's crazy because we've heard he's Hitler. Okay. So it's, that's only the surface. It's like, oh my gosh, he's Hitler. And that's just the beginning. What else is there? There has never been now granted we're some of the more vocal former Trump staffers but he has been denounced by all of his most senior staff, something we've never seen in modern American history before. Multiple White House chiefs of staff, multiple secretaries of defense, his former national security advisor, his former White House communications director, um, people who saw him in the most important decision-making environments have spoken the, to the fact that he is unfit and that he poses a threat to democracy. And, and people need to wake up to that. Oh, well, we're what woken up. We're woken up. We can't wait to get in those polls and vote hard for him, okay? Because nobody believes anything you guys say because you're liars. Clavicle girl being the prime example. So the TDS Spice Girls are gonna be out and about. We're gonna see a lot more of them, no doubt. And we're gonna be here continuing to cover this, my friends. We're gonna see what Trump says, what Judge Cannon says, and how all this unfolds. We're waiting for jury instructions to come out in the classified documents case. Jack very upset about it, Tristan unhappy as well but we're gonna be covering it. Thank you for subscribing and joining us as we do. Appreciate you hitting that like button, inviting someone else to come over here that you know or love to come join us so they can see what's going on behind the scenes in all of these cases. We got great links down in the description below. Sovereignty Saturdays are free. They're over at watcherlodge.com. We'd love to have you come and join us, talk about some other stuff about sovereignty and self-development. And we have watchingthewatchers.locals.com, our members only community, where we talk about other stuff that we can't get into here, like the 2024 election, Joe Biden's dementia and other things. Links for those are in the description below. And we look forward to seeing you over there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends, now let's carry on. We're moving over to New York with Bragg. Alvin Bragg rages at Donald Trump's request to recuse Judge Juan Mercan. You remember that judge who has the daughter who worked for Kamala Harris, you know, the opponent of Trump, also raised millions for Adam Schiff and other Democrats. Adam Schiff was censured, by the way, if you missed that. But Bragg says, how dare you, Donald Trump, castigate our loved and cherished Juan Mercan and his DNC daughter. We're gonna read and see what his recusal says. And then simultaneously, Juan came out and denied Trump's presidential immunity request and does not wanna postpone this trial. Says, this was untimely, okay? Even though the Supreme Court is considering the presidential immunity issue right now, we're gonna carry on with this trial and do our very best to convict Trump before the election. We're gonna have reaction from Trump himself, Hillary Clinton, Stephen Smith, and Michael Avenatti from prison. My gosh, even agrees with us. Bragg and Mercan's gag is ridiculous. So here is what Bragg said in response to Trump's demand that the corrupt biased judge recuse himself. Bragg came out. He said, a dear honorable pff, Judge Juan, the people respectfully submit our motion that opposes 
Trump's letter seeking your recusal again based on your daughter. Trump has identified no change in circumstance, and we know that he has, clearly. We now know that she has all sorts of FEC donation records and has made millions, like mil her company has made millions from Democrats. Defendant has identified no change circumstances, and so other orders denying a recusal are valid. So alternatively, treat this as a pre-motion letter and response, okay? We don't even want to brief this. Just deny it right here and summarily deny Trump's recusal arguments on the merits. We don't even need to brief this anymore. Bragg says, all right, look, Your Honor. First, Trump asserts without any citation, he says, quote, authentic, the daughter's company, has used social media to market its connections to Joe and Kamala while deriding President Trump. But there's no citation for that. Even assuming that this claim is true, it merely reiterates Trump's earlier argument based on Authentic's client list. This court, the advisory committee, have already said that's no basis for recusal, and so there should be no basis here. So in other words, it's the same thing, right? You've already decided this. And second, Trump asserts, again, without any citation, that Authentic, the daughter's company, has received millions of dollars from entities associated with Trump's political rivals, Shifty Shift, Kamala Harris, and others and that some of those entities are associated with legislators and PACs that have solicited contributions specifically based on this case. Now, Trump's own careful wording reveals multiple attenuated factual leaps here undercut any direct connection between Authentic and this case. Authentic has received money from entities. Those entities are associated with politicians, and those politicians have raised money based on this case. He says, what? So he's like, he's like, follow the bouncing ball, says this daisy chain of innuendos is a far cry from evidence that this court is biased. I don't think so. A direct personal or pecuniary interest in reaching a particular conclusion. It's Fannie Willis 2.0, man. We've already seen this. If this judge dismisses this case as he should, because it's corrupt, Guess what? Daughter has no more fundraising campaign material to write her little email newsletters. So the judge has to continue it on. So his daughter gets paid, right? And that's someone you love. Like if you don't do something good for your daughter, what kind of a father are you? There is simply nothing new here that would alter this court's prior conclusion and nothing that's going to benefit authentic or the judge, let alone, let alone this court. Third, Trump faults this court for making extrajudicial comments about the case because remember the judge used the Office of Judicial Administration to act as his daughter's little PR campaign, little PR ring arm, and, and said, oh, she kind of deactivated that account sort of some time ago. To the extent that Trump intends to seek a recusal based on the on article, such a request would be frivolous and it would be vexatious to waste this court's time. Trump fails to note that aside from acknowledging intense preparation, the judge, the article reports that Mercon wouldn't talk about the case. Notwithstanding Trump's claim to the contrary in a separate filing, this article does not report that the court was talking about this case when they said there's no agenda here. We want to follow the law. He's talking an, an abstract. Now, even if the court did have this case in mind, expressing a broad commitment to impartiality is very obviously not a prohibited comment and thus not a basis for recusal. And this is Matthew Colangelo, right? The same guy who used to work for Tish, the same guy who used to work for Biden at the DOJ. He's the person who's really spearheading this. Alvin Bragg's too dumb to do anything, you know, of consequence on this case. In fact, Alvin Bragg, I don't th even think understood it. He didn't even want to bring it. The only reason this case came about is because Matthew Colangelo came over. They hired him, I think, December 5th, 2025. And then right after that, they decided that it was time to prosecute. I mean, about a year later, right? Then an indictment came back down. But this was the zombie case. Uh, Cyrus Vance was a former prosecutor, didn't do anything with it. DOJ declined to do it. Matthew Colangelo came down. He's, you know, the act he's like the target hatchet man uh, of Trump. And he was also involved in the Tish case. So he's still, you know, making the rounds and the person responsible for a lot of this. Now, that happened simultaneously Judge Juan Mercan came out and denied Trump's presidential immunity. And let's take a look at what that filing looks like from Judge Juan. Here he filed this. He says, all right, some background. 
On April 4th, 2023, Trump was arraigned on the indictment. Why'd they wait till 2023 when this is a 2016-17 case? Hmm. Trump filed a notice, a notice to remove to federal court. Trump moved to dismiss the indictment on October 5th, citing presidential immunity. On February 22nd, Trump filed the motion in limine in this case, saying there were a number of exhibits there. 94 statements that Trump made on the media and people filed their motions and more. February 29th, Trump, uh, Trump responded to their motion and we must pre-clear evidence. Okay. So I don't know why the judge gave us all this background. Thank you for that judge. Then on March 7th, Trump filed the instant motion to exclude evidence and for an adjournment. Okay, so you see what's happening. I, now I know why. It's because it's a timing thing. So the judge is going to say, look, this case has been going on for a long time. You got indicted a year ago. You should have brought up presidential immunity a long time ago. You brought it up on March 7, 2024. So he's going to say, it's too late, sorry. Even though this case is at, at SCOTUS or the immunity issue is at SCOTUS right now. Here's the contention. Trump says he seeks an adjournment of the trial, a postponement, a continuance, because we're dealing with presidential immunity. He also wants preclusion of any of Trump's official acts because some of the conduct, remember, some of the payments to Cohen were in 2017 when Trump was in the, president, the presidency. So there is some argument of presidential immunity. Now, Trump argues that he is immune from these prosecutions based on his official acts. The instant matter should be adjourned in light of the recent Supreme Court decision to hear about presidential immunity. And the people should be precluded from talking about Trump's official acts as the president saying he's entitled for immunity for stuff that is within the outer perimeter. The people brag, they cite to criminal law. They say that Trump's claim of presidential immunity is not a basis for precluding evidence. And the people can also, also argue, Bragg also argues that there's no authority for immunity and so on. And, and look, the judge just brings this up as on his own. So this is kind of sua sponte. It looks like Bragg didn't even bring up the argument. Actually, they do. Bragg, Bragg does argue that it is untimely. All right, so the judge is hanging his hat on this one. Bragg says it's untimely. It's too late. Criminal law. Trial starting right around the corner. And we have trial on... Well, it's too late, right? So here, let's see what he says. So the judge writes, for the four following reasons, Trump's motion is denied it's untimely right you just ran out of time says except 45 days i was like what's the timing on this so if they filed on march 7th okay trial was on april 15th how many days is that so it looks like the deadline is 45 days all pre-trial motions shall be filed within 45 days a court's decision on issues of timeliness is discretionary, which is true. So the judge could hear it, but he's gonna say, no, I'm not going to. Defendant appears, why did you file this so late? He says, well, because Bragg filed their motion, we were responding to this. And two, because in February, SCOTUS accepted this. That's why we just had to, to file it. So SCOTUS accepts this on February 28th. They race, okay, like a week later, they turn around a week later, they file their motion, March 7th saying you got to preclude this evidence. And the judge says, sorry, you're outside of the rules. So how many days is that? So from April 15th to, uh, so let's say days between April 15th, what was it? Uh, March 7th and April 15th. Is there a way to calculate this? 39 days, is that right? March 7th to April 15th is 39 days. Is that right? So the two reasons, let's back up on this. Okay, here. The contention must entertain and decide the merits of an appropriate pretrial motion. A court may sum summarily deny a motion that is filed late. 
Okay, so he says it's late. The court's decision is, dis is discretionary. In reviewing the excuses that were proffered by Trump, court finds they're inadequate and not convincing. He says that you based it on two events, motion and limine. Yeah, and I'm trying, I'm still trying to understand. Except as otherwise provided by law, whether the defendant is represented by counsel or elects to proceed pro se, filed within 45 days after the arraignment. and before the commencement of trial or within such additional time as the court may fix upon application. Okay, so maybe the judge set a deadline. Because if I'm if that's right, if that's 39 days, March 7th is 39 days, right? So I think that's right. So if you follow March 7th and trial was scheduled for April 15th, And look, at the time the motion was filed, the trial was set to commence on the 25th, right? So that, like we're definitely within that 45 days. So now the court must entertain and decide this on grounds that they could not with due diligence have previously been aware and may summarily deny the motion. So those two reasons, even when considered in tandem, says the judge, Trump does not does fail to explain while they waited long past the statutory period allotted by CPL 255. The defendant had Apple notice that the people were in possession of and intended to use various statements made by Trump. He was also well aware of the presidential of the defense of presidential immunity, even if unsuccessful. He says it might he knew it might be available to him. He discussed it below in other matters. He also was aware of that defense when they were available to him when he attempted to remove this matter to federal court in May. Nonetheless, he chose not to raise the defense of presidential immunity until well past the 45 day period provided by the statute. So I, I'm just reading the statute wrong. Okay, so I'm re I just read it wrong. So it, it's, it's after the arraignment. Okay, so they want the motions So if, if this is what the law says, right? The judge is reading this, that you have after the initial court date, you got 45 days after the arraignment to file your substantive motions, okay? So like he only had, I think what the judge is saying, he only had 45 days after the indictment or after the arraignment, which would come about 30 days after the indictment or so. Okay, so Trump gets indicted, just to, just to be clear on this, Trump got indicted on April 4th, and apparently the judge is saying, you've got 45 days from that time. Right? I don't practice law in New York, so I don't know if that's a standard thing or what, but that's obviously very short. So the judge is saying, no, you should have filed it, in, it within that 45-day window. He also did not raise it in his omnibus motion, in his motion in limine, or his response to the motion in limine. So this is, yeah, this, this feels very... Uh, orchestrated. Okay. So in other words, the judge was allowing them to file a bunch of other motions, right? The judge allowed them to file a ton of stuff, but then this one, he says, no, Trump's decision is unjustifiable, renders this motion untimely, right? But, but, uh, but he filed his motions in limine after the 45 days, they filed a ton of stuff after the 45 days. So the judge is just being subjective on this, right? He's just deciding I'll allow some motions to go through after the 45 days, but other motions will, will allow you to file. And there's been a ton of stuff that's changed since then, right? Further, and as an aside, the fact that, that Trump waited a mere 17 days prior to the schedule of March 25th, see, that's what I thought the problem was. I thought the judge was going to say it's got to be 45 days outside of the trial, which makes sense. And we have, we have rules like that here in Arizona, you know, because you don't want to bombard people right at the, right before trial. But their argument would be, we just found out from SCOTUS. Like if, if it's the March 7th to the March 25th date, I understand. Okay. That's untimely. 
but they weren't right. The trial got bumped back to the 15th and that would make it not time. You know, anyways, it raises real questions about the sincerity and the actual purpose of the motion, which is so, I don't even know what that means. Judge the, the motion is to dismiss the case. It's we want clearly an adjournment because you're dropping a new discovery, new evidence on the defense. Even the DOJ admitted that there's pre like, obviously we wanted def- uh, an adjournment that is within your right to make that argument. So after all, Trump had already briefed the same issue in federal court and he was in possession of and aware of the fact that they were gonna use this similar stuff at this trial. So when viewed as a whole, this is just done to test this court's credulity. Unbelievable, This, this case is so rigged, I can't even. Turning specifically to Trump's defense of presidential immunity, the procedural history, look at this, together with the procedural history of the federal insurrection matter, How's a judge referring to another case where Trump has not even been charged with insurrection? Okay, like he's never, by the way, never been charged with insurrection. He got impeached for that and he was acquitted on that. But no insurrection, there is no insurrection matter. There's a Trump said some things at a speech matter, right? Like it's all, like this judge absolutely should recuse himself. He's clearly biased, but he won't. Leave no doubt that Trump was aware of the defense, even if, if available, even if unsuccessful, was available to him well before March 7th when the motion was filed. On October 20, uh, on October 5th, Trump moved to dismiss the federal insurrection matter. He could easily say the, the DC case on the grounds of presidential immunity. So he should have filed it here, right? The judge, again, is going outside of this courtroom to say Trump is precluded. In his motion papers therein, Trump specifically argued that his actions as president were in the outer perimeter. The law provides absolute immunity. And so he, he knew it then. He should have brought it up now. Defendant Trump's awareness of the availability of this is further demonstrated by arguments. For example, he tried to remove this to federal case and made those arguments there. Now we say, well, what about Bragg's intention to introduce evidence of his alleged pressure campaign against certain witnesses? The court finds that Trump was indeed aware and he knew about Bragg when he filed this motion and he failed to demonstrate good cause for this late filing. Never mind that SCOTUS just issued an order and they they learn a bunch of new material, some of which might be exculpatory. Now, he has also failed to persuade this court it should should consider this in the interest of justice, right? The discretionary open catch-all. The people noted that the pressure campaign was about, was already included. Trump had notice of these statements. And so then he can't be allowed to bring it up now. Now the court finds that Trump had many opportunities to raise the claim of presidential immunity before March 7th. Defendant could have done so in his omnibus motions on September 29th, which he was allowed to submit. Okay, I guess that one was okay past the 45 days, which were filed a mere six days before he briefed the same issue in the insurrection matter. And after he brought the removal motion. And so having addressed this issue of timeliness and returning to Trump's motion for preclusion, the court reminds we've already ruled on this in limine. And so therefore Trump's motion is denied as entirely untimely. We decline to consider the the, the other issue about preclusion of evidence because it's untimely. This is my decision and order, Judge Juan Mercan, acting justice, of the Supreme Court. Is he not even official? Acting justice? What does that mean? Not even a real judge? Yeah, gosh, been looking at that one. All right, so it, it, it is a cop, right? It's a cop out, right? And the judge is just saying, no, you had 45 days. He found a, a rule and he threw it out. And I've had this happen to me many times, right? Judges, oh, sorry, it's not timely. You're like, your honor, it's not timely because the prosecution told me about it yesterday which is exactly what happened in this case, right? SCOTUS literally just accepted it. If there's a fair judge, he'd say, well, yeah, I mean, SCOTUS has it. There's there's, there's the Supreme Court after all. So makes a reason as to why Trump cannot even have this heard because he wants the trial to go. I'm not considering it's timely. Trump's gonna appeal this, I think. We'll see what happens. I think he'll, he'll probably file an appeal. Like we'll see that in the next couple of days. They're going to be scrambling to try to get the brakes on this case as they should, because it is a hack hatchet job. 
everybody on the left is saying Trump doesn't want to go to trial. If he's so innocent, he should just want to show up. Why would you do that if you, it, it's already rigged and it's a foregone conclusion that you're going to get blown out? Okay, Trump can't even talk about this. You know it's bad when Michael Avenatti is agreeing with us. Here's what he said. He's in prison. He says, we can't be hypocrites when it comes to the First Amendment. Okay, I'll like it, Michael. I'll like it. When it comes to the First Amendment, it is outrageous that Cohen and Daniels, Stormy, can do countless TV interviews, post on social, and make money on bogus documentaries all by talking crap about Trump but he's gagged and threatened with jail if he responds. Yeah, you're right about that, Michael. Not fair at all. Even a broken clock can be right. Here is what MSNBC said some about this. They said, Juan Mercan's amazing. He shouldn't recuse at all. He's doing a great job and he should stay on this case. Here is what that sounded like from these people. No. Shall I continue? It is. It, it was, you know, there wasn't anything then. It was sort of thin gruel at the time. Now it's reheated thin gruel. The only argument is his daughter wor works uh, for as a Democratic consultant. And they've tried to gin up a financial conflict saying the trial will give them business that will somehow uh, redound to Judge Merchan's benefit. Uh, you know, it's it's really uh, tissue thin. And but I also think it's getting really real for him now, Steph. He, you know, less than two weeks, a jury is going to be seated. I think we're going to see a series of desperate maneuvers. And it's hard to characterize this as anything but to stall, delay, do what he's done successfully so far. But now he has to face the music, it really looks like, in this one trial. And he is wigging out. Well, I don't know about that. I think that they're doing regular legal work, which is, you know, your job to defend your client. It's all standard stuff, but they like to make this, you know, emotively conjugated, right? Everything needs to be Trump's wigging out or whatever, but the lawyers are certainly filing, right? What they're seeing is a partisan attack by our own judicial system. So, you know, I am, I don't know if wigging out's the right word. I'd say furious about it because it is not proper for a functional country to have a system that works this way. But here is Hillary Clinton, someone else who had classified documents, someone else whose husband very likely had some unsavory relationships that maybe resulted in payoffs or cover-ups, right? Here she is with her high, high tower, right? Looking down upon everyone else calling Trump an existential threat, saying he's being prosecuted for felonies that she escaped by virtue of the government corruption that protects her. This is Hillary Clinton making the rounds. I mean, it's it's Biden versus Trump. Uh, yes, we know that. It what, is. Uh, it is. What do, you, what do you say to voters who are upset that those are the two choices? Get over yourself. Those are the two choices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Right? And, yeah, and good. you know, it's kind of like one is old and effective and compassionate, yeah. has a heart, and really cares about people, and one is old and has been charged with 91 felonies. <laughs> Hilarious, yeah, that you escaped because our corrupt FBI Director Comey changed his memo, okay? You deleted evidence, like, with a cloth, you saw bleach bits, smashed phones, your Secretary of State was insane. Yeah, okay. I mean. I'm, okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand why this is even a hard choice, really. I yeah. don't understand it. Yeah. But we have to go through the election and yeah. hopefully people will. We have to go through it. We have to just go through it. If we had our choice, we wouldn't do it. Realize what's at stake because it's an existential uh, question. I, what kind of country we're going to have, Talking what kind points. of democracy we're going to have. And people who blow that off are not paying attention because it's not like Trump, his enablers, his empowerers, his allies are not telling us what they want to do. I mean, they're pretty clear about what kind of country they want. Yeah. We do. We want to prosecute you and people like you who have rigged our country and weaponized the entire system in violation of American law. This is Stephen Smith, who is reacting to this. Stephen A. Smith reacts to Hillary Clinton, says, you know, not a good look for old Hill. Stephen, great to have you on set. So what do you make of that? Get over it? 
I don't think it was a very wise statement on her part. How did that work out for her in 2016? I think that's something that we have to recognize. Yes, she won the popular vote, but at the end of the day, she wasn't the president of the United States. It was him. You can look at her not campaigning in Wisconsin in the last days, not campaigning in Pennsylvania in the last days. You can look at some of the stuff that they were saying about her that sort of distracted things from where it should have been in terms of Comey and his report uh, from the FBI. You can bring up a whole bunch of things, but at the end of the day, the last thing you need to do is to do anything that could agitate a potential voter in this particular election. What do you make about the actual argument that she's making? I mean, she's basically saying two old people, yes, Yes. but they're substantively different. I mean, absolutely, one counts against him. Well, listen, nobody's brought that up more than me. Yeah, it is substantive. One is demented, one is functional. Uh, for, yeah. you know, four indictments, 91 counts, impeached twice. I'm not voting for him. I've said that to a lot of people. I've said that to you. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, is that at some point in time, you've got to take into account what the voters thinking about. The voters, a lot of them out there, tens of millions of them out there, by the way, don't care what he's going through right now. They don't care about his guilt or innocence, his perceived guilt or innocence. They don't care about the 91 counts. They're thinking about their lives. And a lot of times we see politicians taking the positions that they're taking and while we can respect their candor and their honesty, they do seem a bit detached at time from they what do. the voters are actually feeling and what the voters are actually thinking. Nobody wants to hear that from Hillary Rodham Clinton at this particular moment in time, because especially if you're Joe Biden, what are you really, really worried about right now? You're worried about folks coming to the polls. You're worried about them showing up to the polls to vote for you. You're not worried even about them voting for Trump. You're worried about them not showing up to vote for yeah. you. That doesn't exactly encourage them to get up out of their seats and go to the polls. All right, so we'll keep working on Stephen A. Smith. I think he may, you know, he sounds like he's, he's getting pretty close to joining on the Trump train over there. Not happy with Clinton. And obviously, I think a lot of the people in the country are recognizing that they can keep calling Trump a dictator maniac. They can keep throwing that around. 91 felonies. No one cares, right? And as more truth about these charges comes out, as people start to see, wait a minute, the Michael Cohen trial is like a spreadsheet crime? Wait, 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 what? Then they'll start to recognize what a joke this all really is. Here's Trump saying, sorry, Hillary, you're the threat, not me. To save your country, this country is finished if we don't win this election. And I heard somebody say it, a scholar say it, uh, two, three days ago said, if we don't win, this may be the last election our country ever has. And there could be truth to it. That's where we're going. Because Joe Biden is a threat to democracy. He's the threat to democracy. Thank you. Yeah, punks, not Trump. You are. All right, so we're seeing this continue to escalate there, you know, Trump's an existential threat. I don't know how Trump's an existential threat, right? The guy, they said committed an insurrection that didn't actually seize control of the country at all, or even close to that. And then left, you know, on the 20th, like just voluntarily left. They said he wasn't going to do any of that stuff. And then he did. So we ask ourselves, who is really the existential threat to American living, the American way of life? Is it the people who censor you and shatter your First Amendment rights? Is it the people who prosecute innocent people to make them political opponents of the state? Is it people who try to throw other people off the ballot? Yeah, they're the existential threats to the American experiment. They're trying to shatter it every which way. We're going to be here continuing to cover it, my friends. And thank you for joining us as we do. Thanks for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video wherever you're watching it. Would have really appreciate it if you invited someone you know or love. Just share a video with them. Share a short with them so that they can see what's happening here. That way we'll help wake more people up and expand the truth of what's really going on inside these courtrooms. We got great links in the description below, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, our members only community where we do streams in the morning, streams on Saturday. We have an amazing community there. We also have our sovereignty and self-development community, which is at watcherlodge.com. We're starting sovereignty Saturdays, all free. Go check it out. Come join us. Let's talk about some sovereignty and some self-development. You know what I mean? We'll see you over there. We'll see you right back here on the next one. All right, my friends. And we got one final segment left on the day before we hear from you. Let's see what's going on in Nebraska.
The battle for Nebraska is pushing 2024 into a very contentious fight. One electoral vote is all that is in the swing and the balance of power that might decide the next presidency. This is all being started by Charlie Kirk. He posted a truth, a tweet about this that caught the governor's attention that Donald Trump endorsed that's now causing some serious activity in Nebraska to make it a winner take all state. Right now there's one electoral vote that the Democrats are pretty reliant upon. And if this law changes, they're gonna freak out. In fact, they're already freaking out. This guy on Morning Joe says, they're changing the rules. <laughs> and we noticed they did a lot of that back in 2020 when they used COVID as the pretext to file lawsuits and get secretaries of state like Jocelyn Benson to change everything to support their electoral strategy. But this is what started it all. Charlie Kirk, you know who he is. He sent this one out on X. He posted this on April 2nd, and boy, how quickly a good idea can take off. He said, you know, suppose Donald Trump flips Arizona, Georgia, Nevada next fall. Sounds pretty good. Current polls show him doing that. Would he win the presidency? Not quite. In fact, if Trump flips those three states and no others, he loses by exactly one electoral vote. Why? Nebraska. Despite being one of the most Republican states, Nebraska awards its electoral votes by congressional district. Some go red, some go blue. It's not winner take all like most of our other states. Now, thanks to this system, Omaha their electoral vote goes blue. Obama won it in 2008. Biden won it in 2020. The big cities, man. He's likely to win it again this year. Now, California would never do this, obviously. New York would never do this. Split those up so Republicans get some votes? Yeah, right. And as long as that's the case, neither should we. Of course not. This is completely fixable. Very easy to do this. Nebraska's legislature can act to make sure the state's electoral votes go towards electing the candidate that the vast majority of Nebraskans prefer. And there's already a bill ready to go called LB 764. All Nebraska has to do is put it up for a vote. Now, as I write this, Charlie says, the Nebraska legislature is still in session. Nebraskans should call their legislatures and their governor to demand the state stop pointlessly giving strength to their political enemies. Okay. Amazing. So shout out to Charlie Kirk on that one. Now, this caught major fire and the governor came out with a statement. He says, you know, it's a pretty good idea. Why don't we do that? So, you know, we stopped uh, getting steamrolled by the Democrats. Here is what the governor said. His name is Jim statement today on winner take all start right, right after Charlie posted this. He says today, governor Jim Pillen introduced the following statement in response to a call out for his support of the bill introduced by Senator Lippincott. The bill proposes the reinstatement of the winner-take-all system for electing presidential and vice presidential candidates, awarding all electoral votes to candidates receiving the highest number of votes in the state. I, the governor says, am a strong supporter of Senator Lippincott's winner-take-all bill and have been from the start. It would bring Nebraska into line with our 48 fellow states better reflect the founder's intent and ensure our state speaks in one unified voice in presidential elections. I call upon fellow Republicans in the legislature to pass this bill to my desk so I can sign it into law. Amazing. Now, Charlie also posted an update to that. He said, hey, check this out. Huge update. Governor Jim Pillen has responded to our call for the great state of Nebraska and shout out to all our friends in Nebraska to return to an electoral college winner take all, and he promises to sign the bill if it lands on his desk. So we just gotta get it there. A big thank you to the Charlie Kirk Show audience and everyone who picked up the phone and made this happen. PSA, if you live in Nebraska, please contact Senator Aguilar and Senator Sanders and quote respectfully, right, very respectfully, Ask them to move this bill through the committee. LB 764, winner take all. Here are the phone numbers of those senators right here on your screen. 
pause it if you're in Nebraska, if you're one of those people. Let's get this done. Very important. Here's why. Trump also agrees this should be done. Here is what he said, in fact, over on True Social. Trump said, Governor Jim Pillen in Nebraska, a very smart and popular governor, and handsome too, who has also done some really great things, came out with a very strong letter in support of returning Nebraska's electoral votes to a winner-take-all system. Most Nebraskans have wanted to go back to the system for a very long time because it's what 48 other states do. It's what the founders intended. It's right for Nebraska. Thank you, Governor, for your bold leadership. And let's hope the Senate does the right thing. Nebraskans, respectfully ask your senators to support this great bill. And that's from Donald Trump. Now, stuff is happening, okay? This guy, McDonald, switches parties. So the state senator, McDonnell, he tells a news agency... Today, I'm changing my party affiliation to Republican, adding the Democratic Party has decided to punish me for being pro-life. And so we don't know what his future plans are, but there is a lot of activity afoot over there. And here's some background on what this is going to mean, right? What are the consequences of this? Pretty dramatic, as NBC News tells us. Let's see what they say about all of this from their article. They tell us Republicans now are upping the pressure on the state's nonpartisan unicameral legislature to make this change before the presidential election. Meaning one body, no House and Senate, just a Senate. But despite the pressure from Republican heavy hitters, the push could fall short as the legislative session draws to a close after a previously introduced bill languished. Speaker said, we have a process. It includes an introduction, a committee hearing, prioritization of the agenda. And this was not prioritized, so it's in committee. So I can't, I can't schedule it if it's in committee. Now they're hoping that they can move it forward. Can it overcome a filibuster? We don't know. Shout out to Charlie Cook. Kirk, he put out a call for this. And man, I got to just say, this happened fast, right? Charlie makes a post, governor has it, now Trump has it. It's like, whoa! Governor Jim Pillen of Nebraska, a very smart and popular governor, has done some really great things, came out today. Kirk said in a statement. Now, here's, here's where this comes down to. Okay, what is this all about? It is about 538 electoral votes. But the change could have far greater repercussions than it seems. Okay, it's just one vote, right? Here's how it works. Biden won 306 electoral college votes in 2020. Trump got 232. But things have changed pretty dramatically. If Trump is able to win back the key Sun Belt states like Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada and doesn't win anything else, Nebraska's split electoral vote becomes of paramount importance. In that scenario, under the current rules in Nebraska, Biden would win the presidency with 270 to 268, okay? But if Nebraska has that one electoral vote that goes back to Trump, it's now, guess what? A tie, 269 to 269. An outcome that would send this to the House of Representatives. Now there's one reason why Democrats are blasting the change. They're very upset about this. The Nebraska Republican Party are eyeing this to dilute our influence. Omaha has gone to Obama and they launched a petition opposing the bill. And of course they're outraged about this saying, how dare the Republican Party change the rules right before the election? Give me a break. Okay, we covered, I can't tell you how many dozens of lawsuits that the Democrats filed under COVID to change the rules. Efforts to pass this legislation fell just one vote short in 2016. And so we're going to see if that changes these days. Now, here's more from Semaphore saying Trump and Pillen endorsed legislation. Charlie Kirk uh, suggested it. In just 200 words, Charlie Kirk urged this to happen. And guess what? It caught. Five hours, 10 minutes later, Pillen put out a statement, then Trump. 
Now, the district has drawn special attention, right? If Biden lost these three, a change would cause a tie. Pillen's statement drew murmurs from Democrats. No other state awards their electoral votes this way. Democrats who hold just one third of the state Senate, they were skeptical that Lauren Lippincott's bill would pass. A freshman Republican introduced it 14 months earlier, remained in committee, has not had priority to pass by April 18th. So they got to get this done like now. The Nebraska Democratic Party is watching this closely. They still believe we have the votes to stop this. Democrats seem very surprised by this. And we'll see where it goes. Of course, the question is, can they get it done in time? It sounds like the deadline is April 18th. So shout out to Charlie Kirk. And honestly, shout out to the governor and shout out to Trump for being so Johnny on the spot with this. Just boom. Good idea hits. There's like 15 days, two weeks to get it done. And they're freaked out about it, which means we got to get it done. All right. So if you're in Nebraska, you know what to do. Here is how it sounds on Mika Brzezinski's show called Morning Joe. The governor there has thrown his support behind an effort that would no longer allocate the electoral votes by a congressional district. Because right now, it's five votes there. Yeah. Typically, Republicans get four, and President Biden, Democrats get the one from Omaha. That's right. If that changes, and we don't know that it will, it's the state legislature is going to look at it. But if that changes, that takes away Biden's best path to win. Because if you get, if he wins, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan but loses the other swing states and no longer picks up the one in Nebraska, 269. Uh, that leads playbook this morning, the alarm among Democrats that this is possible. What do you think? I think this is what the modern Republican Party has become. They're now changing the rules in the middle, trying to benefit themselves. Wah, wah. This is the, you did the it in hell that Donald Trump hath wrought. Uh, in the middle of this, changing the rules 200 days before the election is ridiculous. I think you're right. I think there are real uh, simulation problems. When you look at the map, that one electoral vote really matters in the combination of other things. Then you need another state. Yeah. Um, and so... The easiest pathway to victory has always been the Midwestern three states combined with Nebraska. Um, something tells me they're not going to get away with it this easy and there will be a national outcry for trying to change the rules here. But it looks like it looks like they might get it done. OK, there's a lot of momentum and enthusiasm to do it. So let's go. OK, if you're in Nebraska, get on those phones. All right. You know what I'm saying? Get on those phones, call your senators and let's get this done. So, again, make a shout out to. Charlie Kirk, Turning Point, the whole crew that blew this thing out of the water could have some serious consequences. And so we're going to be here continuing to cover all of the 2024 litigation and the news as it unfolds ahead. And we're looking forward to having you join us as we do. Thank you for subscribing, my friends. Thank you for liking this video wherever you're watching. Thanks for inviting someone you know or love to come over, watch the lives with us. We'd appreciate that. That way they can see what's going on here. We got great links down in the description below. Don't forget to check out our members only community where we talk about some other political and legal topics at watchingthewatchers.locals.com streams in the morning, streams on Saturday and members only after parties after our live shows. We also have watcherlodge.com, which is a little bit different content. It's sovereignty and self-development related content. And we have sovereignty Saturday starting this Saturday, all free. Go to watcherlodge.com, register, add it to your calendar, and we'll see you there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends, that is it for us on the day. We got a big battle in Nebraska, going to be a lot of fun. We've got Bragg raging at Trump's recusal and Mercon denying the immunity. And Jack Smith is now threatening Cannon. If you don't find in favor of us, we're going to appeal your booty up to the 11th Circuit and we'll see what Trump and Cannon say in response. But now, my friends, it's time to hear from you and to see what you have to say about all of this with your amazing Super Chats donos. Extremely grateful for your support and everything that you do to keep the train on the tracks over here. We got some new Membos that are coming in. What's up, Jennifer? Is bringing in new Membos. Thank you, Jennifer. Bringing in Tom S. Hello, kittens. Coming in Kyle L., Steve O., and Eric H. All gifted Membos, courtesy of our friend Jennifer who's a membo, bringing in more membos. Hey, we got Joe Bay. What's up, Joe B? Joe B. R. 
another new supporter joining us on the YouTube Membos. And YouTube Membos also get the morning shows and the Saturday shows. So come check us out. Joby, you'll, we'll see you there. Hey, this one. Oh, this is one from Kimber Rock. It says, hey, Rob, hydroponics takes a lot of expensive nutrients and testing gear. Aquaphonics is far better, especially in warm areas. Plus, you have fish to harvest. Well, so this is one of the things we're talking about on Locals and that we're going to be talking about at the Lodge. So I am now sourcing some of those vertical gardens. Have you seen those? These vertical gardens that are basically hydroponic. So they got these big containers at the bottom and then they pump water up to the top and it just trickles down and you can grow all your plants out from the side. It's a vertical tower. I'm looking at a 48 slot and we're going to learn how to grow our own food, man. We're going to learn it. So good to know, Kimber Rock. Sounds like you know what you're talking about. We're going to be leaning on you for sure. We got Dolphin Fan is the man. Bring it in. Oh, Jennifer, that was yesterday. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for sending that one in. Very grateful. Jennifer, you're, you're, you're awesome. Dolphin fan is the man is also awesome. Bringing in Membos. Tony B. Tony Baloney. We got LaDonna A. We got Ryan's here. Rabbit Stick is here. And Aubrey Day B. Joining us, courtesy of Dolphin fan is the man. Bringing in new Membos in the house. Uh, Cowboy Rob says, so technically could Trump have taken the JFK files home with him? Um, I would make the argument that yes, I would make the argument that yes, he could. Yeah. He's the executive. They're his, uh, you know, if he, like uh, if he wants a copy of it or something, right. He says, uh, the executive branch houses, these materials, these are executive branch documents. I need them for something and they are now personal records, right? I think he could do that under the law. And there was nobody who could challenge him to do that. Because, and, and you might have a disagreement about that. Like you might say, well, that's not really, a, well, okay. Then you can exercise that judgment when you vote for the presidency, or you can pass a constitutional amendment that takes that power away from the president. And I haven't seen one yet. They're just congressional statutes as far as I'm concerned. And says to add to my last question, but then how is there certain people in government that can classify stuff the president can't see? Need to know bases. Yeah, that, well, that, that's a great question. And I'd like to look at a, a specific example, but I think if the president demanded to see something, uh, he should be able to see something. And I don't know what that context would look like. You know, they might say there are other agency records or something like that. But I mean, if the president really flexed his nuts around or, you know, his muscles, then, um, I think you could get access to them. Yeah, he should, he's the president. He got elected to the highest exec. It's the chief executive. So if he says, I need to see that in order to do my job, that's the president. Amazing. Hey, here's one from Cowboy Rob. Now, Spud says, shades of the evil robot box from Logan's run. A nice link from Spuds. What's up, Spuds? Good to see you. Glocky says, here's a question for all you lawyers. Is the judge in New York trying to get himself kicked off or recused off the case? Yeah, by referencing the insurrection matter. It's like, are you kidding me? Dude is clearly biased. Here's what Julie Kelly says. Holy crap. Says, can someone send this clown a copy of the indictment? Yeah, there's no insurrection at all. Yeah, good point, Julie Kelly. No insurrection at all. Never was charged with insurrection. Just charged, just impeached by that. And then, of course, was acquitted on the impeachment. Tony Hay Munkett says, if you're a president, current or past, and they bring up charges on you, it should go straight to the Supreme Court. Shouldn't have to go through this circus and the Supreme Court should decide whether they hear it or not. Well, you're pretty close on that one, Tony Hay. I think that the right mechanism is to go to Congress, right? If, like, if you're a president, they think that you're guilty of a crime, they should impeach you. Then we know it's not political because two thirds of Congress says, okay, you did a bad thing. Then that strips your presidential immunity on the charge in the impeachment, then they can prosecute you. They tried to do that with Trump. They failed. And now they're trying to have two bites at the same apple. Can't do that. Janice J, what's up, Janice? Our new supporter, Janice. Welcome aboard. It's great to see you. We'll see you on our members only streams. Yeah, Grifty's here, right? So I, we were just reading that wrong. It's within 45 days of arraignment, not the trial. And it was, it was, it was phrased strangely, right? So let's just zoom back in on that. 
because this is what the judge said. Here was the rule. Yeah, so the contentions. Here is what the law, and, 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 like the reason I was, it's quoted, right? Like this is what the law says in quote except as otherwise provided by law, whether the defendant is represented by lawyers or himself, all pretrial motions shall be served or filed within 45 days after arraignment and before commencement of trial. And there's no comma in there, right? Or within such additional time as the court may fix upon application of the defendant made prior to the entry of judgment. So the second phrase is, you know, basically the judge can set the time frame. Otherwise, yeah, it's 45 days after the arraignment and before the commencement of trial. Within 45 days, it's, and, and this is a quote, right? It's quoting the law. It's just a weird, it's kind of a strangely worded statute. Because a lot of other criminal statutes, the, 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 the prohibition comes as you approach trial. Like you can't file stuff within 10 days of trial. You lose your up, right? We're ready for trial. Like you're done. And we know that there were a ton of motions filed 45 days after the arraignment. A ton. I mean, we've been reading through them here. How many motions have we read here? A lot. And they're all 45 days after the arraignment. So the judge is just being, you know, picky and just choosing what he is going to preclude. And of course, goes against Trump. You're right, Grifty, on that. Thanks for that. Hey, hey, it's the Monkets bringing new membos in. 10 new membos from Tony Hay Monkets. The Dejneatronic is here. Pamela G, Lori M, Moon Pie's here. John B, Chuck, Hex Sailing. Snake Pliskin's here. Escape from New York. Evie's here. And Sleeping Psychopathy in the house. Very good to see you there, Sleeping Psychopathy. Good to have you here, Tony. Thanks for bringing in 10 new membos and welcome aboard new members. Sheila, Sheila P as a membo says, love this show, but especially love this community. That's what it's, that's the real value proposition here. Community, connection, energy, energy, right? Good to see you, Sheila. Love you back and love the community back. Chubby's here says, wasn't the hush money case set aside for a period of time because of the Chutkin trial? Yeah, it was. It was all on the back burner until all of the other trials got deviated. Now they put it to the front burner. So is Mercon still counting that time against Trump's defense motions, saying he didn't file in a timely manner, even though the case was on hold? Yeah, that seems fair and balanced. Well, I just, I, his, his real basis was using the 45 day limitation, which he could apply, he, he could have applied to anything, but he paired that with Trump waited, you know, Trump didn't file that at earlier junctures and then just decided to invoke the 45 day limitation. It's very subjective, right? It's not, it's not impartial. He's biased. Cowboy Rob says, how can a prosecutor present new evidence and not allow motions to go forward on the new evidence? Well, it would be the judge. The judge would decide what happens after the disclosure of the evidence by the prosecutor. So Alvin Bragg got dumped a big tranche of files from the DOJ that has already declined this case. The DOJ already investigated this and declined it. And that declination apparently didn't result in them transferring all the materials back over to the prosecutor, Alvin. So Alvin then drops that on Trump. Trump says, we need a continuance, an adjournment on this. And they turned around and said, no, you don't need more time to review any of that. NY says the office of court administration also has authority to elevate judges who sit on lower courts, like a county court or family court to the Supreme court to address caseload needs. Such judges are known as acting Supreme court justices. Very interesting. NY. Yeah, we have stuff like that, you know, like we call them commissioners who are kind of uh, lower. They sit as a judge position, but they're commissioners. We got this from Fred. The, the things all these people are getting away with question mark. It's a great question. And a good statement, Fred. Good to see you. We got this one from B-Man says, sure. Judge Juan is getting something on the side. A daughter can give daddy some nice gifts. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure Juan is happy that his daughter's doing very well out there in the world, prosecuting Trump. 
One R5 from Rumble says the Constitution is different and special for Bill Clinton. Yeah, that's true. I forgot because he's got his own special Bill Clinton version because he's pals with Sleepy Joe. And so by extension, Joe's DOJ and the entire Democratic Party. They're all in cahoots. It's a big, big incestuous party that Trump is not a part of. Rain says, lived in Nebraska all my life. Never thought we would be the center for change for a presidential election. Well, Rain, if you know anybody who's still living there, get on the horn with them. Tell them they got some work to do. Spud says, Nebraska has a unicameral legislature. No separate houses like the House or the Senate. It's a great comment, Spuds. And it's good you're here to fill in the gaps for us when we're talking about unicameral legislation. We got Brian M. says, People continuously bring up the felony charges from this DOJ. Bringing this up means less than me saying I'm a billionaire because I have a bunch of monopoly money. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Brian. In other words, they mean nothing. It's just, you know, toilet paper. Your indictment's toilet paper. You have no credibility. You have no legitimacy. Half the country doesn't think that Trump committed a crime and they think that you're partisan prosecutors. So keep saying it if you want, but nobody cares. XSSFD says, I believe that every state should do it the way Nebraska has been doing it. All or none doesn't show what the voters really want. I think think that's a good point. I think there's a lot of probably red Republican votes in California that we could use, you know, like California's like what, 55, 58 electoral votes. What if we got 40% of those? Would that change the balance of power? I think that is true that there would be, it would, it would shape, it would reshape the whole, you know, the whole country could be interesting. Catherine Rex says, Wade is looking at contempt, new filing from the X Wade is looking at contempts. Maybe we'll get into that one tomorrow. Should be fun. Thank you for that. Catherine cowboy. Rob says, here's an example. Aliens. Aliens. Yeah, Trump should take home the alien documents and share them with us. Jeffrey Adams says, Rob, Cannon should find that Jack was hired illegally and dismiss the case. Just call his bluff. I would like to see that happen. Not sure it will, but I'd like to see it. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good to see you here. Thanks for being here. Hey, hey, it's the Monkets bringing in five more members. Tony, hey, Noble Victory. Andy H, Fire Salamander, Robert M, and Will 2021 coming in courtesy of Tony Hay Munkets in the house. Hey, Jennifer, who sent one in yesterday, says, Rob, thank you for filling out brains with more knowledge. Have a beautiful evening to you, Rob, and to the Watching the Watchers fam. Three exclamation points, all right? Watching the Watchers fam, that is a directive to you. Have a beautiful evening, courtesy of Jennifer. And thank you, Jennifer. We're grateful to have you here. You help fill my brain. So thanks for, thanks for doing that. I could, I need it. Nitty Linny says the impeachment process is all about checks and balances that our country is built, built upon. Yeah. And it's the formal process, right? It's like, Hey, use this process. If you have a problem with the leader, but they don't do that. They got Bragg prosecuting, big fannies prosecuting, deranged Jack Smith, E. Jean Carroll's filing claims. They're trying to throw him off the ballot. All the things they already tried to impeach him and they failed. So they're trying the next best option. Tree Climber is in the house, says five bucks for the team. Thank you, Tree Climber. Great to have you here. Thanks for being a membo on top of it and supporting us. Grateful for it. We got Melanie says, hey, says just sending a little support. Melanie, thank you for, thank you for that. It's very generous of you. Very nice. You're a membo. Always good to see you. Says thanks for all you do, Rob. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for all you do for being here, supporting us, being a membo. We love you. We got Tony Hay says, I don't care what anyone says about Nevada and Arizona. Arizona got robbed. I know Trump won. And I live in Arizona. It was, it was, it was weird here in 2020. It was weird. There was a lot of Trump energy, but it was COVID. It was weird. But I, I had the same vibe. I was like, Arizona? What? And they called it weird. And then in 2022, it was very weird with Carrie Lake, like, on election day, half the machines didn't work for like four hours. We covered all of that. So I agree. I think that there's shenanigans afoot in Arizona. Rain says, if Cannon rules Jack Smith is illegally appointed, is he still able to appeal since he isn't a lawyer anymore after the ruling? Yeah, I would say he'd be allowed to appeal that. 
Um, Cause she would, you know, she would stay, you know, the dismissal of the case and all of that. It would all be stayed pending appeal, but yeah, I mean, that could be a, that could be a big one, right? Jack Smith, you're just invalid. Sorry. They are invalid. Those Reno regulations, like that is not what the justice system is supposed to be about where you just find statutes that you need from multiple sources, multiple locations, and then cobble together a whole new position of power that en enables you to have somebody who's not even lawfully appointed with no checks and balances at all on no checks and balances at all on the person who's in the position. And look at this one, Richard, <laughs> Richard, this is such a, this is so fun. Okay. How cool is this? So Richard just sent this one in. Let me take a quick look. Okay, love this. Okay, Richard, Richard Wadsworth. What a fun picture. How cool is this, my friends? This is why it's fun to hop over on X. You never know what you're gonna get. And you can follow uh, random uh, watchers out there in the wild. Richard Wadsworth says, love watching the watchers. Great work, Mr. Govea. You, sir, are a national. Thank you for that, Richard. Look at these great pics, man. Richard. Flashing the goods, man. Little Dan Bongino in the house, huh? Little bit of Mark Levin in the house. I see some Cash Patel in the house. Bunch of great names there, great reads. Good stuff from Richard. And here, Oregon for Trump, baby. We got Oregon for Trump in the house. How fun, Richard. Great pictures, man. You look good. You look healthy. You look happy. You look like you're energized, ready to get out there and save America. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. We got Christina says, best content out there. Thanks for the info. Thank you for that, Christina. And hey, Flash did the math. Flash did the math. 39 days. Yeah. I was calculating it all wrong, but you know, what can you do? It's good to know because I was thinking it was 45 days before the trial, which would also make sense. There's other laws like that, like in Arizona. We got this one from Russ. They could not meet the 45 day filing requirement as the SCOTUS notification, the 22nd was 45 days, therefore the deadline date. If the ruling date was accepted as being the time limit is okay, says Russ. We got feline fun, says I'm of the opinion that Cannon should give illegitimate Jack a good smackdown, hold him in contempt, put him in the slammer, teach him a little bit of humility before the trial. I'm awake now, says the craziness will only escalate. Russ says Nebraska needs a change over there. And we got what's up from Raven Madness and others. And so my friends, that's what's happening over on the X platform. You can follow us over there. Rob Govea, ESQ, follow other watchers out there in the wilderness on the X platform and stay connected with other friends out there. My friends, that is it though for us on the day. We are gonna leave it there and head on over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only debrief. We love to see you there. robertgovea.com is the website where you can access all the PDFs, the merch store, the show calendar, the watcher watch list. You can also get the newsletter sign up and a bunch of other stuff there, robertgovea.com. We have Sovereignty Saturdays at watcherlodge.com, it's free. We're talking about sovereignty and self-development. I just posted over there at watcherlodge.com some great quarter two questions that I got from a guy called Greg Eisenberg that are great. So it would be good to see you. Come and join us. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about national advisories, warnings from CISA, whatever is out there. Come and join us, watcherlodge.com every Saturday, 1030 Pacific, 1.30 Eastern is the time for now. Before we wrap it up, wanna say thanks to our mods and our meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly. Our friends, Vantique is prime. K-Bean in the house. We got Just Cause, Playin' Hooky, Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, our friend Janek, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, modding the fort down, keeping things nice and orderly for us. And we're grateful. We got Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Jigam Gigam over on Locals. So grateful to have our mods and our amazing meme smiths helping us. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We had a couple other donos that just came in. From Roger. Roger says, I've been interrupted every five minutes of this stream 
for Joe Biden's campaign ads and health department ads and anti-Second Amendment ads. Very annoying. Please send help. Uh, you know, first, I, it, you're right. It is annoying. Ads are annoying. And, you know, the, the way that you get around that, unfortunately, is to just subscribe to YouTube, YouTube uh, Red, YouTube Premium, whatever that is. Gets rid of the ads. It's a no-brainer if you watch a lot of YouTube, as I do. Now, that being said, what this indicates to me, my friends, is that Joe Biden is financially supporting our show, right? We get we get a, a piece of those ads here, right? That's how we stay on the air here, once we get, you know, some of that. So JB, Joe Biden's campaign ads and Second Amendment, anti-Second Amendment ads and health department ads are all funding the show, which I'm not even mad about. Joe Biden can pay us to bad, to, 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 I was going to say badmouth Joe Biden all day. I'm fine with that. Keep that gravy train coming. Unfortunately, you have to see some of those ads. But it's good, man. Drain their coffers, okay? We want them coming here. It's not going to change anybody's mind here, is it? Hopefully, it's not changing your minds. Hopefully, not like, you know, this Rob guy's okay, but that ad was very convincing, and I'm voting for Joe. Rob's an idiot. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's working. Maybe that's going to happen. I don't know. But yeah, you know, I don't know that, that it's a good use of their campaign dollars, but it's 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 them spending money and it's coming out of their pockets into ours. So thanks for suffering through them, Roger. Thanks for suffering through them. All right. We got this one from Lady Ice it says, I totally agree with splitting the electoral votes. Living in central New York, we are more or less blue, except for like four or, or five major cities. Yeah. Yeah. Or we just split those states up, right? You know, just split up California. I still think Arizona should, should go take over the lower portion of South of, uh, we should go liberate. Okay. San Diego, get some beachfront property. All right, my friends. So thank you so much for sending those in. We are going to leave it there on the day and we're heading over to locals to have our members only after party. We'd love to see you there, but if not, well, that's okay. Tomorrow is going to be Thursday. This week is flying by. Can't even believe it's Thursday tomorrow. Oh my goodness. And we're going to be back here to get into it again. And we're going to need to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.